Hi, everybody. Um, have you had also this nice conversation with an application developer and you ask him about IPv6 and you get this stare blank face? So why should we even bother with IPv6? Well, if you think about it, that guy probably didn't understand IPv4 either. Um, I'm Andy Mintnich. I work for IBM. I'm going to tell you a little story about our journey and a journey it still is towards IPv6. Um, I won't answer or bring anything up about products or services. I'm the wrong guy for that. This is purely about our own internal network. So I realize as an enterprise networking guy, I'm probably a minority here. And we tend to be a little shy, both in peering for connectivity or peering for social. But if you look at it, at the V6 uh, thing happening out there, it seems to be everywhere but the enterprise. So if, if you're in that boat, you have either customers or you have your own enterprise still thinking, well, do I even need IPv6? What the heck? Start to look around you. Um, it's been driven outside. It's been driven by the market outside of the enterprises and, and has really gotten a lot of momentum. So if you're in that position, where do, where do I start? Um, and uh, this is basically kind of how we got started uh, a couple of years ago in IBM. It's basically with the, with the prior slide, you're going to get past this question of if and go to a question of how and when. And basically, the thing that resonates with your finance guys and your management likely is that you tell them, look, if you know it's inevitable, um, we're installing new products every day. Um, some of them have a lifetime of five, six years, even if we don't need IPv6 now. If you don't think about it now, you might rip out something in four years from now when you realize you need IPv6 that may, may have had some lifetime still ahead of it. So that's kind of, you know, you, you, you get the ear of the finance guys when you say, well, there is a chance to influence the cost of IPv6 rollout through timing, and timing means start as early as you can, ideally now. Make your way up to the CIO, you know, get sponsorship, get buy-in from him or her, um, and name someone, name a technical champion, one who works with the other technology towers, you know, one who can have that technical conversations with all the other architects, but also have someone like an executive sponsor, a person that is present in those kind of funding rounds when the project money gets distributed. So you want to make sure that you also get, um, you know, hopefully some seed funding for IPv6. Whatever you get, and let's, let's face it, I mean, nobody will say, here is a multi-million dollar budget, go roll out IPv6. That's not going to happen. But even with the money you're getting, you can start small and grow over time. You know, starting is better, better than waiting. The way we did it was basically the money given, we focused on certifying new services. You know, where, where do I get the most bang for the buck? I don't look at all the legacy stuff. I don't look at the stuff that nobody wants to touch anyhow. But I look at the new things, and I look at certifying new stuff, new services, and then, then leverage them to kind of roll it out. Change your buying guidelines. And the, the last one, be an evangelist. It's, I think it's equally important to not only be the techie guy that has the techie conversations, but also be someone to reach out to as many groups as you can in your uh, corporation. Talk to the hosting guys, the, the front-end load balancer team. You know, talk to, to anyone you can talk to, um, basically, and you know, keep knocking at their door. Keep talking about IPv6 and, and spread the word. If nothing else, at this early stage of the game, it could be as little as get yourself more prepared for IPv6. So if you made that decision, it pretty much, you know, it starts with an IPv6 address plan. Um, depending on your kind of size, whether you're corporate enterprise or whatever, multinational, um, you might fi may find some examples out there. However, a lot of things, you, you, examples you'll find will be around providers, carriers. Um, another advice is talk to some of your peers, enterprises, corporations, the same size, the same, in the same area. Understand how they have done it. And there is no right or wrong. 
Um, there is, you know, you can learn from them, learn from the mistakes they may have made, but in the end, you need to make your own decision. And, and there is a couple. Um, one of them, for example, is as a multinational, where do you source your prefix from? Do you just use one prefix from one of the RIRs, or do you go to each one of them and source individual RIR, uh, prefixes? For us, we kind of weighed the pros and cons. Again, there is, this is not a black and white answer. Um, we went down the path of going, of going and get just one prefix for the internal network. Mind you, there is others for other parts of IBM. But for the internal network, we just got one prefix from Aaron, because as much as like we refer to the internal as the nine dot network, we wanted to have a single prefix we could refer to in the future from an IPv6 perspective. Now, having said that, the, the address plan we came up with, um, you need to think about what kind of hierarchy, what kind of structure do I build into the, this? How much do I base it on kind of technology? Your, I don't know, the, 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 your backbone, your network topology today, which is likely gonna change. How much do I base it on geogra geography, kind of proximity of sites, which is probably a more stable thing? The interesting thing when you do that is when you talk to people, you want to get this feeling of what, what do you think it would look like in five years from now? And people tend to have some idea of what it might look like in five years. When you ask and in 10 and in 15 or even beyond, because this is likely how long this is going to last, you, you'll probably not get much of an answer. So I think it's a combination. You need to see what is stable, what is something that's going to stay but also leave enough room in there for the unexpected, for things you didn't know right now when you build the address plan. And when I said we got one from Aaron, basically the thing we did was internally, one of the structures was that we carved it in a way that uh, it mirrored the, the country allocations to the RIR. So even, even if it's an Aaron prefix, we have a section in there which is called RIPE, AFRINIC, APNIC, and all our IBM sites in that region fall under that range. So if it come to the worst, you know, we could source individual prefixes from the RIR and only readdress a region. So this is something you really want to spend some time on, on the address plan. Um, it requires some thinking, some discussions with your internal peers, hopefully with, you know, other companies of similar mind, and uh, you, you want to really take your time to, to make this a, a proper address plan. Um, this is one of the slides I have in pretty much every presentation I give um, in the company. I want to make sure that everybody understands, well, yes, we have still a very heavy dependency on IPv4. And when I say we enable IPv6, for us, the only meaningful way at the moment is to go dual stack. But I do want, to understand, want people to understand that this is a transition architecture. It means that we're running two stacks, two IP stacks in parallel, and it comes with a burden. So yes, we will have, you know, we do have v6 capable IP services. Um, I, I put tunneling in brackets. Avoid it if you ever can. Um, so we had it in the early years when the wide area wasn't capable for for maybe a dozen sites, we sunsetted it. Go native wherever you can, avoid tunneling. Um, the, the kind of beauty of, of dual stack, the good thing about it is that you can still, you have this leeway out. Your, your network management tooling, the things that might still rely on IPv4, they can because it's still around. Your endpoints will choose the best way to connect. It gives people some comfort that yes, there is always IPv4 to rely upon. However, the, the additional burden of two stacks is something in the long run we want to get away from. You know, the, the target architecture really is IPv6 only, back to a single stack network. And I mean, it's clear, you know, V4 in parts of the network will be around for decades. So it's, you know, you, you rather build this as a service encapsulated on the, uh, into V6 on top of it, rather than run it natively still on your, on your backbone. So how do you start spreading it around the globe? Um, an enterprise of our size, we operate about 40,000 routers and switches and another 20,000 access points for our IBM offices around the globe. So we have very stringent standards of how we roll out things um, into IBM sites. So people sometimes ask me, is there a dedicated IPv6 team? And I tend to say no. 
you, you need to have a few people coordinating a little. But then in the end, what you want to do is you pull the senior architects from each network discipline. You, you work with the campus architect, the wireless architect, the data center architect. You pull those guys who know their business into your V6 discussions and you work with them on Make them understand what IPv6 means for their environment. You make architectural decisions, you start developing solutions, and then you, you, you need to test and certify in your lab. You, you kind of get, need to get familiar. Then you start publishing your new updated configs, your templates, and you know, with that money you've been given, that, that little kind of uh, seed funding, you, you start running a few pilot sites. You apply them, you apply them into production. And in a large environment, this is where it gets funny then. If you open a, a task for someone in, you know, on the other side of the globe and you tell that delivery person, oh, go deploy dual stack, go deploy IPv6 to that uh, campus, and that person says, oh, no, we don't support IPv6, and you say, well, you do. Look at the latest templates. It's there. It's, it's been tested. It's been certified. Go apply it. And you will notice that even though you worked with the senior architects before, you know, your technology, your config, your running config might have, or hopefully will work okay. But spreading the word into all the other groups, into, you know, service management, the delivery organizations, they will come up likely with questions you never thought of before in their operational procedures, in their tooling. And, and it's really until you get someone to really touch it, feel it, and work with it, um, that people start to realize that, oh, I need to think about this or that, and I need to update my procedures, my documentation. So it, it's really interesting as you roll this out um, around the globe with various groups and people of different skill sets, um, how they embrace IPv6. And as you roll it out, you, you kind of, you know, you, you review for consistency, you start building a baseline, how much time does it take for me, um, depending on your uh, degree of automation, you know, what does it mean in addition to applying a regular config to apply v6 for the first time? And then the, the thing about influence and the cost is, you know, with this seed funding, with the few first pilot sites, you hopefully have your people now become familiar with the new configurations. They know what, what this looks like, they know what to do. So once you've done that in a given country, um, you start trying to move things into business as usual. So you leverage the, you know, an existing uh, hardware equipment refresh project when there is a greenfield site, a major site move or relocation. You start to leverage these kind of lifecycle opportunities um, to go implement IPv6 along with it for a very little delta, as opposed to a kind of more expensive, you know, dedicated IPv6 rollout project. So the kind of things we've achieved in, in, the, uh, in the past uh, few years is we pretty much have wide area transport for the traditional MPLS uh, or sites over internet. We offer it for LAN and wireless LAN for end users. Um, into the data center, we offer uh, IP services, DNS, DHCP, uh, internet gateways. And uh, also, the, in, in the size of our environment, we needed to kind of have a proper asset inventory so we could do a V6 rollout tracking. And I'll show on the next slide a little bit uh, more details about this. Um, so far, we have uh, covered uh, more than 100 sites around the globe, uh, the footprint of uh, over 100,000 IBMers. Most of them are using IPv6 actively. It uh, depends, you have still have some older machines around which may not pick it up, but for the most part, it's, it's like, if you will, a, a hidden demand. As soon as you offer it to clients, to endpoints, they start picking up and you will see um, IPv6 production traffic in your network. Now, having said that, um, the majority of our production traffic at this point is still destined for the internet, for V6-capable websites and services on the internet. There is a couple internal services um, we have on IPv6, but really the, ma the majority of the traffic um, today is, is for internet-based sites. So, since 
we don't run this kind of concerted effort to do an IPv6 rollout, but rather want to leverage the life cycle, the opportunities, and you know, people all around the globe to kind of spread it. We, we needed to do some kind of tracking, and in our tooling, you know, we had Obviously, there was a field for IPv4 address, a field for IPv6 address. One of the things we, for example, added was, let me see, uh, the, this one here, IP version configured. Um, and this can be IPv4, IPv4 plus IPv6, or IPv6. The reason why we added this is because you could have a device which might be a, a layer two access switch. Um, that doesn't have a, a v6 management address yet. It's you know the, the the bit of you know config management and stuff. It still does over IPv4, but it might have already some first hop security features applied to it. RA guard, DHCP snooping, these kind of things. So we we needed to have an indication um, to say yes. Well, this device might not have yet a v6 management address, but it has been configured for IPv6 in the environment it is in. And then you, you, know, you, you start to drill down into metrics, you filter you based on per device type, per platform, and you, you kind of trying to see where you are um, from a rollout perspective um, with things around the globe. And one of the things, it, it kind of sounds simple, but um, you want to make sure that you have these three things in place, wide area transport, land routing, and the DHCP scopes. It sounds rather simple, but often you will find that Maybe people didn't think about all of them. You know, they did one piece but not the other. They forgot to add DHCP scopes. So you really want to kind of also um, have an eye on your routing table, the, the way things are configured, the consistency checks I mentioned before, that uh, really all these pieces are uh, put in place so that it basically works for an end user. Um, I think we heard it on the in the presentation before. Have a lab, do test. Yes, <laughs> I can only attest to that. Um, we came across numerous bugs, so really, you know, work with your vendors, sweat the equipment, um, do the configurations, do the test runs. Um, these are examples from three different vendors, and um, one of the lessons learned, I think, is it, it is. It, possibly difficult to plan for the amount of time you need for developing a solution or for testing, because you likely will run into bugs. Um, it, it's, it's like new territory for many people. You know, you, they may not have done v6 testing, they need to update their test gear and all the things, they need to update their test procedures, and then you run into a bug and you file it with a vendor. And um, also one of the things we learned is that vendors treat your bug reports very different. Um, some of them are quite, you know, reactive and uh, come with solutions and, and fix them. Some say, well, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, so it, it's very different dep um, depending on the vendor uh, on how they kind of treat V6 features. And don't, don't believe their marketing slides of, yeah, we have feature parity between V4 and V6. Um, the challenges we've seen. Um, well, I think as a networking guy, if you talk to other networking people, most often they will know what you're talking about. They will, oh yeah, cool. You'll find a couple others that say, oh, finally somebody got around to do it. But you will want to reach, you know, as many as you can. Um, to that point earlier on, be an evangelist. You know, speak up. Um, you know, go to as many people as you can. Do internal briefings. Do you know? The, the talks to other technical communities, make them aware, make them aware what IPv6 means for them in their environment. When I said, you know, dual stack is nice because you can fall back to IPv4, it, it is also a downside because, well, you maybe, maybe you're not noticing that something is wrong on a v6 side. So how do you properly monitor both IPv, IP stacks for availability? How do your end users might not even notice v6 failing because they're still working on v4 but something might be wrong and you know that's something you really want to keep an eye on that yeah after the initial configuration the rollout both protocols worked fine but 6 months down the road maybe someone screwed something up on the v6 side on the config 
and you don't realize until it's too late. So really, your, your monitoring and your operational landscape also need to kind of adjust for that dual stack environment. Now, I said IPv6 uh, as a dual stack is the only sensible um, environment for a large-scale deployment for us at the moment. Last year, there was a, a North American v6 summit at the LinkedIn headquarter, and there were two presentations kind of next to each other. One was um, a guy from T-Mobile US standing there. Yeah, we have a couple million customers on v6 only, working quite fine. There is an odd corner case with a few websites here and there, but that's about it. Next on the stage was Cisco saying, oh, we heard from so many customers that v6 only is so hard, so we tried it ourselves. Picked a building in San Jose, 500 people, did it on their own wireless, and you had them talking about, oh, we had product development, we had distinguished engineers, we had war room clinics, walk-in clinics for people to come, and it was just so different to that presentation before, where you realized that in an enterprise world, things are so much different than maybe you know, on the mobile space, where you do a bit of browsing and email, and uh, you know, in the enterprise, you have all your legacy applications, you have different user groups. So um, that is still, I guess, one of the big things in the enterprise space, and even if you look at some of this IETF draft stuff, uh, a lot of uh, kind of transition technologies are focused towards carriers and ISPs, but not so much for the use of enterprises. We, we start to use some, but I don't think there is a golden answer to this yet. And uh, another one is about multi-homing. If you want to do this hybrid WAN thing where you have uh, some larger consolidated egress gateways in a region, but you also want to do some kind of a local breakout in your sales office or whatever, you have an internet connection there, and you, you call that hybrid WAN. In IPv4, it's kind of easy. Outbound, you use something like policy-based routing, left or right. Um, and both the local breakout and the central, they will have different IPv4 NAT pools. So by nature, the return path will be symmetric. You'll come back in through the, the same firewall as you left. If you don't want to do any address transition in v6, that becomes much more difficult. So there is work ongoing to try and look at this, how you use multiple source addresses and you pick a different source address based on the service you want to reach. But the thing is, I mean, this is, this is at kind of standardization discussion. It's not something you will find in products out there today. Um, so if you want to do this, if you want to do something like hybrid WAN and you have local breakout, you probably need to think about some way of a translation, whether it's uh, some prefix translation or whatever um, at your local breakout, because or, or using proxies to hide, hide behind a, a few selected IPs, but uh, kind of a just firewall routed um, egress with preserving the source address is really um, not possible. So with all of that, already in place, what's, what's coming, what's on our roadmap. Um, from a remote access perspective, we had uh, kind of a pilot instance up and running for two or three years now. I want to embrace that to more production instances around the globe, give, give more um, IBMers dual stack remote access. And start, uh, it might be the same for you. I mean, there are these projects around you, software defined network in the data center, wide area, campus, whatever leverage them, start to work with these teams and see you know, what you can do from an IPv6 perspective in their projects, what, what kind of opportunities would be there driven, you know, try to write these other projects um, and, and leverage them. Despite the difficulty I mentioned before of piloting IPv6 only, um, I want to try it. There, there is nothing but to experience it. You, you have to have some uh, some kind of a pilot environment, do a test run with uh, kind of a selected user group um, to really find out what exactly the problems are and how you can circumvent them. It's, it's no good in just talking about it and complaining that it doesn't work. So um, really kind of, you know, getting in there, trying to work it and, and see how we get from there. Think about new opportunities. Look at your current network architecture, your network configurations, 
and try to find where you have legacy things in from IPv4. If you, I mean, I don't know, maybe you come across some old kind of Cisco validated campus design, this three-layer architecture of core distribution access. Maybe predating the multi-chassis lag, which was mentioned before, you have access layer switches that had two VLANs on them, so you could utilize both uplinks to both distribution switches. You kept broadcast domains small because ARP you know, didn't handle them properly. If, if you really drill into, you probably find a lot of things that were driven by deficiencies or limitations of IPv4. And as you start to roll out IPv6, see if you can remove them. If you are thinking about like, like the VXLAN or some, some SDN-based overlay type, think about, you know, is there a chance I can remove some of these old legacies, some of these kind of history that, that was tied to IPv4 and, and do things slightly different in an IPv6 way? Look at your, maybe your, the way you'd provide DNS internally. It's for historical reasons, you've had these many IP addresses um, be in your DNS servers. Maybe as you stand up a DNS v6 service, maybe it's time to look at doing this as an any cost service in your global enterprise. You know, try to do things different and try to challenge kind of the old way of doing it in IPv4. Um, things we, we are doing, and I guess that goes back to some of the uh, presentations earlier, is beyond the, the normal tooling, making it IPv6 aware, um, you know, do log parsing, feed it into machine learning and analytics. Again, one of the goals monitoring this dual stack operation, understanding that both stacks are up and healthy. Um, some, some, of, some rather th simple things. If you have a tool, you know, you have your network management that's drawing nice AS topology maps. Well, it does so for IPv4, and it may be doing it for IPv6, but there is no easy way to compare them. You know, yes, it shows one, and you have to click five or six times that you can see the other. It, it's, it's like this when you get into the operational landscape that um, you start feature requests to your vendors to improve on, well, maybe, yes, they offered some v6 functionality, but they can improve on you know, how you run it in a large-scale network. And then, certainly, you know, capturing any lifecycle opportunities. Again, we've, my, the funding I'm given, I, I spend on certifying new services. I don't care about the legacy stuff. The legacy stuff can go away over time. But if you, if you, fund, it, if you fund the new stuff um, and you certify it from the get-go, when you put a new equipment on your uh, buying list, when you develop your new SDN solution, start there with introducing IPv6. And as these solutions roll out, um, you kind of get your IPv6 rollout in a BAU mode, in a business as usual. So, in our case, it's been a journey for several years, given the size of IBM. Um, depending on yours, it might as well. So, hopefully, I could kind of uh, give a bit of a, a wake-up call to enterprises to catch up with the rest of the world for IPv6. And uh, that's it from my side.